Hi, everybody. It's another episode of the Generalist CCFP 105 Topics Podcast. Today's topic is pain, and we'll try to relieve your pain about learning this topic by focusing on all the high yield content. Boom. This episode was written by that wonderful voice you just heard, Vejvi Patel, third year med student from the University of Alberta in Edmonton. And she also got expert review by Dr. Stephen Yam, family med doc practicing oncology and palliative care in Fort Mac, Alberta. Thank you for having me on. Vejvi, my favorite tree is a Douglas fir. What is your favorite soup? Tomato. Nice. I like it. Pure. All right, let's dive in. Let's rip off the band-aid and get started. Objective one. In a patient presenting with acute pain, provide analgesia while seeking a diagnosis. As we all know, obtaining a good pain history takes time. If you have a patient presenting with severe acute pain, you first want to provide them with analgesia before you dive into the history and physical exam. This is going to help the patient get some relief. It's going to make it easier for you to talk with them and examine them. And if you have a well-appearing patient that has a little bit of ear or back pain, you can postpone the analgesia until you have a diagnosis. Absolutely. And our goal in an urgent or emergent setting is not to completely eradicate their pain, but to provide them with some symptom relief. What? Before you administer any meds, you want to ask them about allergies. You want to ask them for a history of liver, kidney disease, because obviously this can affect what you can give them and how much. And that can also help you choose your analgesic based on it. And this leads us to our next objective. Objective two, when assessing a patient with pain, take a detailed history to recognize clinical patterns to inform your diagnosis. Yeah, this would include asking them about their chief complaint and then asking follow-up questions like rating their pain. So for example, maybe they would rate it zero stars, would not recommend. I personally like using OPQRSTU, which is quite comprehensive in terms of a pain history. Getting these aspects of the history help narrow our differential. Be certain to clarify if there's more than one pain generator, because there totally can be. And if there is, you need to repeat your whole OPQRSTU or old carts or whatever you choose for each site of pain. As painstaking as that is. <laughs> <laughs> So how might we classify pain? Classically, three broad categories. There's visceral pain, there's somatic pain, and there's neuropathic pain. Visceral pain comes from organs and their connecting and supportive structures. It is characteristically described as pressure, aching, cramping, squeezing, deep pain, which is diffuse and hard to localize and sometimes can radiate to other non-visceral structures. That's that thing like stupid heart pain that goes anywhere. It can also have a pattern of escalating intensity or it can come in waves. A classic example is menstrual cramps or abdo cramping that you can get from indigestion or gastroenteritis. Somatic pain originates from simulation of noise receptors in your skin, muscles, or bones rather than organs, which is why it's well localized compared to the visceral pain. And it's why your appendicitis goes from weird, crampy, all over pain to, oh, right lower quadrant, and we have a diagnosis. Superficial somatic pain originates from the skin, from the subcutaneous tissues, and maybe from the mucous membranes. It's generally talked about as sharp, prickling, stabby. This type of pain is very easy to point to. They'll show you. In comparison, pain originating from joint capsules, connective tissues, fascia, muscle and bone would be considered deep somatic pain, which is less well localized and described as an aching, cramping, throbbing, dull, more of a gnawing pain. Finally, neuropathic pain. It's a result of damage or dysfunction of your central or peripheral nervous system. It sometimes presents as pain in response to a specific event like a trauma, for example, or it can just come out of nowhere. People are mysteries. This pain is often described as burning, numbness, tingling, electric shocks, and even pins and needles, and can often radiate down the nerve or have a glove and stocking presentation. A classic presentation of this is diabetic neuropathy. And there's another lesser known category of pain that we call other. I just did quote fingers. This is used to classify pain that doesn't fit into any of those three classic categories. Moving on to... 
Objective three. In a patient presenting with pain without a clear diagnosis, include life-threatening conditions in your differential and investigate them appropriately and in a timely manner, because you're a good doctor. Man, oh man, that is a big objective. We've all heard that patients don't read your textbooks because diseases may not present with classical symptoms. There's a few life-threatening conditions that you want to keep in mind when there's a patient presenting with pain. We might start with chest pain. You're thinking of the big ones. Aortic dissection, MI, pulmonary embolus, pneumothorax, uh, Borhaves. With abdominal pain, you'd consider testicular torsion, ectopic pregnancy, uncontrolled bleed, or any traumatic rupture of organs. And don't forget some of those classic chest pain diagnoses might actually present as abdominal pain. Like an MI, somebody can say they have a crampy stomach or something, but they've actually, they're having a heart attack. Definitely. And in a patient presenting with headaches or migraines, you want to keep things like temporal arteritis, intracranial hemorrhage, carbon monoxide toxicity, and encephalitis on your differential. Nice. Some of these life-threatening conditions don't have a clear history or other specific signs and symptoms. So you have to investigate appropriately and in a timely manner per the objectives, even if you do have the pain under control. Such as a thunderclap headache. You want to get a CT and then an LP if it's not clear. And then for temporal arteritis, if you're highly suspicious, get a CRP and then a biopsy to confirm. So to slightly twist the topic over, let's do... Objective four. When there is concern about drug-seeking behavior in a patient with pain, maintain your therapeutic relationship and do not attribute the presentation to drug-seeking without first considering your broad differential diagnosis. Yeah, this is a really important topic. So if you're confronted by a patient who may be displaying drug-seeking behaviors or one that you might suspect of malingering, it's important to be empathetic, avoid stereotyping, and to properly manage your frustration. Basically, manage your countertransference and keep being a doctor. Many pain medications can result in dependence and improper use, but the second part of this objective is to not attribute a patient's presentation to drug-seeking behaviors. Especially not before you've listened to their story. Consider potential reasons for their pain and also think of the other biopsychosocial aspects that may be contributing to their experience of pain. With all this talk about pain, how do we go about treating it? Oh, that's probably pretty important. Objective 5. When treating pain with narcotics, dose appropriately considering narcotic naivety and renal function, consider addiction risk, and consider variable and potentially dangerous metabolic responses. Narcotics are effective analgesic agents in the context of more severe pain that cannot be adequately controlled with non-opioids. You need to prescribe these drugs responsibly and under the right circumstances after appropriately educating your patients about the risks and other alternatives. If they're narcotic naive, you have to ask them about allergies, pregnancy, breastfeeding, kidney disease, and when considering risk of addictions, ask about mental health issues as well as any family or personal history of substance use disorders. The opioid risk tool is a quick and easy way to categorize the risk of opioid abuse in your patient while taking a history. We've included this opioid risk tool in the show notes for those who are interested. And then in all cases, when you are prescribing, it's good to do start low, go slow. You don't want to overdose, especially with these meds. In a patient who has a higher risk of opioid abuse, Use, you want to try to use the non-opioids as long as you possibly can. And then if you do need opioids, do it in small quantities or use other methods so that you can avoid causing the many addiction issues. In a patient with renal failure or one undergoing dialysis, you want to consider hydromorphone or methadone. For renal or liver failure, think about fentanyl. So for the elderly, it's recommended that we use 25% of the starting dose as they can often have renal impairment. So hydromorphone is usually the best drug to use. And one final thing to think about is potentially dangerous metabolic responses to opioid use, including respiratory depression, mm, sedation, tolerance, hyperalgesia. Don't forget this one. And sudden loss of painful stimulus resulting in changes to sympathetic tone. AKA crumping them. In pregnant women, we want to be cautious about opioid use because it can result in neonatal abstinence syndrome in the newborn. Or if you're abruptly stopping opioids, it could result in abortion or preterm labor. And in those breastfeeding, opioids can pass through the breast milk and result in respiratory depression or even infant death. <laughs> 
Although they super commonly use so morphine's pretty popular for women just because we're scared of everything else a little bit more. The moral of the story though is that we need to be cautious when you're prescribing due to the many potential side effects. Speaking of which, don't forget to prescribe appropriate laxatives along with every narcotic you write. I was taught exactly the same thing. The hand that writes the opioid prescription writes the laxative. And one aspect that can easily be mixed is our next objective. Objective six, when prescribing medications for pain, inform the patient not to use over-the-counter products containing the same drugs or drugs from the same class to make sure they're not reaching toxic doses. Some examples would include T3s and Percocets, which both contain acetaminophen. And remind patients only take one NSAID. This gets very confusing for people because there's so many different product names that are the same. Things like naproxen, Ketorolac, ibuprofen. And this brings us to... Objective 7. When you're treating a patient with pain, appropriately use non-pharmacological treatments and self-management strategies to control their pain and to optimize their function. So don't forget the basics like stretching, physiotherapy, heat and ice, and rest, although not too much rest. (laughs) Other options can include things like acupuncture, massage, massage, osteopathic or chiropractor manipulation, yoga, mindfulness, and dietary considerations and self-care or self-efficacy strategies. This is super important stuff because your pain experience is an important overlay on the biological stuff. All of these have mixed evidence and their effects and context are patient and context dependent. When used in conjunction with your pharmacologic treatment, they can help create the optimal approach to combating your patient's pain. But what about patients who continue to have pain despite being given opioid? It's compartment syndrome. <laughs> they need a fasciotomy. <laughs> <laughs> that was easy. Well, I think that brings us to our next objective. Objective 8. In a patient whose pain is not resolving or following the anticipated course, regularly re-evaluate. So you'd reconsider your diagnosis, the current medication choices, and any other complications. First, make sure they're taking the prescriptions as they're written. If they're not, find out why. What are the obstacles? Can they afford them? Are they worried about becoming addicted? If there's any red flags for diversion, order a urine talk screen on the spot. Verify your original history. Did you mistakenly classify them as neuropathic pain or as somatic pain? Last, if your patient's experiencing psychological distress, counseling is a big part of this pain treatment plan. Well said. And that brings us to our final objective. Objective 9. In a patient where acute pain has become chronic, you have to recognize the transition and readdress the treatment plan and your patient's expectations. When pain has lasted for more than three months, it can be classified as chronic. Nearly 8 million Canadians live with chronic pain and face a wide range of physical, emotional, and even social challenges on their day-to-day basis. 8 million? Isn't there only like 40 million people or less? That's crazy. This is why, though, it's super important to readdress the treatment plan and your patient's expectations. Treatment goals may include a reduction in pain or improvements in cognitive health, psychological health, social function, and physical function. In terms of pharmaceutical treatment, the WHO analgesic ladder, which you've probably heard about, here's a quick reminder, and it's in the show notes, provides a great approach to pain management. Adjuvants can include things like tricyclic antidepressants, serotonin, norepinephrine, reuptake inhibitors, anticonvulsants like gabapentin or pregab or even topical anesthetics can be useful along with non-pharmacological options. Uh, Like the osteoarthritis episode, we talked about duloxetine quite a bit. Um, And if you go back to the palliative care episode, we talk about pain a fair bit in there as well. You also want to manage your patient's expectations. They have to know that you're not going to kill their pain. You don't want to overpromise and communicate in a way that the patient's going to understand. You're not saying nociceptive and neuropathic. You're talking like a human being. You're going to try and establish a good rapport as you always do and a professional relationship with your patient goes a long way to gaining trust and improving their experience well i think that brings us to the end of the episode hope that wasn't too painful to listen to ouch 
<laughs> thanks for writing this. You're awesome. Thanks to Dr. Yam for reviewing it. Everyone for tuning in. You are the reason this exists. We've got lots of cool things coming this year as well from some dedicated people and more and more people like Vaishvi coming on and making things happen. You're the lifeblood. Take care. Bye.